Now let us join together in a season of prayer. O oh Lord, draw near to us. Help us to know your presence in the air around us, in the beauty of the earth, the flowers, the great mountains as they rise above us and remind us that this creation is, after all, yours. Help us to be better stewards of it. Help us to stop putting things on the earth that despoil it. Help us keep from dumping things in the water that pollutes it for everyone else. So we pray today for those who work for a cleaner environment and a saner way of living on this fragile crust of land that you have given us. We pray especially for those who are trying to clean up the river spill in the West even this morning. We pray, O oh, too, to you, O oh Lord, for thanks in thanksgiving for the spirit that you imbue in teachers who make them want to care for our children. You have made them so that they are called to that work, supported in all that they do, and guided by your spirit that our children will have this, the spark of in, inquisitiveness have their minds sharpened by the discipline of discernment in thinking. Give those teachers support, Lord. And not just teachers, but all those who care for and watch over and plan for our children as they go back to school. We pray for, especially for teachers as they go back this week to prepare themselves and their space to receive those young minds. For a young mind wasted is not just a terrible waste, but is somehow a breach of the covenant that we have made with you to teach our children well. We give you thanks, O oh Lord, for all those in this church who do your work and not just this little church, but the church around the world that seeks to make people well, to give people hope, to help them recover from illness and disease, to help them rebuild their lives following disasters and wars. And so it is today, O oh Lord, we ask your special blessing upon all those workers around the world who do so in your name. And those who do your work, even though they may not publicly be able to proclaim your name. We pray, O oh Lord, for those in this congregation who are ill, who are facing great difficulties in their life, who even are facing the end of this life, be with all of us. Let your Spirit come among us to support us in our journey, in our spiritual journey and in our life's journey that we need not have anxiety about anything at all but to know that you are with us to guide us and support us and give us courage for the living of these days to their fullest. And so it is that we pray for Tim. We ask especially that you will open his heart to the love that surrounds him and let him have courage to know that he can approach others and you in his life. 
We pray for the Westview Baptist Church, O Lord, for we know that no meeting, no discernment, no decision is so important to a congregation than voting for their pastor today. We ask that you guide them in what they're doing, that they may speak the truth in love and care for one another in this important day. And we pray for Stephanie Engel. We know that she had heart problems as a child and she's having tests this week. We ask that you guide the doctors and the nurses that she get the very best care. And so it is, O oh Lord, that we make all of these prayers in the name of him who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Our first reading from Scripture this morning is from 1 Kings. Uh, it's broken up into two little pieces, one uh, in second chapter, the 10th through the 12th verses, and then in the third chapter from the 5th to the 14th, actually in the bulletin it says the 3rd to the 14th verse. Listen for the word of God. Then David slept with his ancestors, and was buried in the city of David. The time that David reigned over Israel was forty years. He reigned seven years in Hebron and thirty-three years in Jerusalem. So Solomon sat on the throne of his father David, and his kingdom was firmly established. Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of his father David, only he sacrificed and offered incense at the high places. The king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the principal high place. Solomon also used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I should give you. And Solomon said, you have shown me great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness and righteousness and uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept him from this great and steadfast love and have given him a son to sit on this throne today. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in this place of my father David, although I am only a child. I do not know how to go out or come in, and your servant is in the midst of the people whom you have chosen, a great people, so numerous they cannot be numbered or counted. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people able to discern between good and evil. For who can govern this, your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked it for this. God said to him, Because you have asked this and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, I now do according to your word. Indeed, I give you a wise and discerning mind. No one like you has been before you, and no one like you shall arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor all your life. No other king shall compare with you. If you walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, 
then I will lengthen your life. And this passage from the New Testament, John 6, the 35th verse, and then 41 through 51. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. Then the Jews began to complain about him because he said, I am the bread of life. I am the bread that came down from heaven. They were saying, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, Do not complain among yourselves. No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me, and I will raise that person up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. And I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. This is the word of God for the people of God. And let them say, This passage from 1 Kings is one of the most moving in the Old Testament. It is one of those passages that even as young people we might read and go, oh, that seems very uncharacteristic, even for the Old Testament. It's probably one of those maybe a dozen passages where there's a conversation between God and someone human that really feels like a conversation. That really feels like we could have been sitting there watching what's going on. The backstory to this conversation, we didn't read through all of it because, frankly, it's not in the lectionary, but if you happen to miss the point that it was broken up into two pieces, you would have been entertained by the story that that all is not so nice and neat and clean for Solomon as he gets on the throne, and, and that this passage takes on a much more important role, uh, a much more important character in the life of Solomon and in his reign, because, frankly, that story about Solomon consolidating his power on the throne is pretty awful. Um, you know, Solomon was not the eldest son, nor was he the eldest son even after the eldest son had hanged himself in a tree. Solomon was down in the pecking order. Solomon was a child of da David's older years. And Solomon was pampered and taken care of, and was so young that even in his dreams, Solomon says to God, I'm just a kid. I don't know what I'm really doing here, and it's only the love that you had for my father that has carried me through this far, and I pray that you will have the same love for me to guide me about what I'm doing. Because the part before that dream is that the way that Solomon consolidates his power is that he just eliminates that part of the family that would have challenged him. He, sh you know, he tracks them down and eliminates them from this life so that they have no power to rise up against him. 
and they become a cautionary tale to anyone who might have challenged his right to be on the throne. And I think it's kind of convenient, you know, that we have this dream after all of that icky stuff has already taken place. And when Solomon, in his dream, talks to God, he asks for God, asks for God guidance. One might even think that Solomon asks for God's guidance because when he says, I don't know how to come in or how to go out, you know, that he's literally talking about, I've done all this stuff or I've commanded all this stuff to happen and I'm really, really uncomfortable with that. I am convicted by the goriness of that, by the, the uh, inhumanity of that. And I'm not comfortable with that. I need your guidance. I need you in my life to help me discern what is right. And God in this exchange is so impressed with Solomon's request for understanding and discernment of what is right says to Solomon, yeah, I'm going to give you that. I will give you discernment of what is right. I will give you understanding of what's going on. I will make you a great ruler. And then, in addition to that, I will make you a great king. You will have all that other stuff that I was worried you were going to ask for. You're going to get it anyway. As my friend Harvey Howell in Texas always says when he's doing presentations, but wait, there's more. And then he says this curious thing. And if you follow the statutes that are my statutes and you follow the law as your father followed the law, you will also have a long life. And certainly he did. Oh, that Israel could have learned from Solomon. Oh, what a shame it was that Solomon seemed to be the only one who was really concerned about doing what was right because what followed after Solomon really was rather much of a downfall of the whole uh, household. And what happened over the years after that was an Israel that, that, that lived in fits and starts of religious piety that... Uh, could get it right for a few years. Uh, it was like they could, you know, they could do the one really great uh, uh, season of righteousness, and then it all fell apart. And they would go wandering after other gods until finally God sends them packing off to exile. Israel, at least as much as many of their neighbors new hardship and deprivation that even made our depression seem like a fellowship Sunday down in the hall as they were packed off lock, stock, and barrel off to another country and then came back to a country even after the exile that was absolutely decimated. And I think it may have been those experiences that, that made the people very, very hard in their dealings with one another. Oh, they, they made pretense, maybe even more than pretense, of, of following the commandments and following the law and listening to what the, the rules were and, and guided by them. But man, they weren't going to give you anything more than just what they absolutely And one might even think because their lives depended on it. If there were one iota more generous than they were required to be, or, or one jot or tittle to give someone else a break, it might do them harm in the long run. These hardened people were remarkable and notable because in their midst were those who were not hard. And so it is today that in this 
last reading we're going to do from John for a while, that they come to Jesus, and listen again, they come to Jesus and they complain to him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. These hard, cynical, bitter people come to Jesus and they say, listen, we know this dude. We know this guy. We know his parents. I know where you came from. I know your parents. I know what your father did for a living. He wasn't God. You didn't come from God. We know better than that and don't try to dupe us. They're challenging Jesus on the very core and heart of his life. <coughs> and what's remarkable about this passage is that Jesus doesn't scold them for their attitude. No, he, he doesn't, in, as he does in other places, he doesn't throw them out of the conversation by saying, you know, you get out of here, you deceitful and viperous generation. Get out of my sight. He instead reiterates to them the promise. And he addresses their skepticism unambiguously. I am the Savior. Whoever believes in me will never That is the claim that has been over the centuries an embarrassment for Christians. Because you see, in that time, even down to today, with some of our newer forms of faith and belief and mania, it's really important to have a Savior who's a winner. You know? The one who goes through hard times and comes out on top. The one who wins the race, not the one who runs hard with great heart and graciousness towards one another. You know, those people who we give that, you know, Miss Congeniality Award to, that's the consolation prize. You were nice, but not terribly good looking. Even in that time, even in that time, a God was supposed to be God. And in that, you know, in that Roman uh, Middle Eastern understanding of gods and goddesses, you know, gods only interfered in human life when they were bored. And they wanted to make mischief with human beings. Gods had their own little arguments and family feuds going on that were providing entertainment for the mortal down here. And the only interchange came when one of the gods got a little over the edge. In contrast, Jesus offers himself up not only to death on a cross, but invites us to eat of his body that we might have eternal life. And this is shocking news. Gods may give people great wealth. Gods may give people great power. Gods may give people insight and special news. Gods don't give eternal life. God is God and does not become human. The only God who Gods who take on human form in the Greek myths, and most of, of that is about warfare between gods, divine lust, or power, all of which are repugnant to a good Jew. And that's part of the issue that the Jews have with Jesus. And so what he's talking about sounds faintly like a Greek mythology. They knew God as the covenant maker, the creator, the judge of the world not someone who showed up. Secondly, Jesus, Jesus promises 
a food which gives eternal life. You see, their memory is that even the Israelites, when they ate manna in the wilderness, had food just for that day. Manna did not give them eternal life. As a matter of fact, it says in the Old Testament, it reminds us that the, the Israelites had to stay out there wandering in the desert long enough at least for the first generation of those who left Egypt to die. So that part of God's plan was to bring into the promised land only those who had known the wilderness, not those who could yearn for the good old days of the flesh pots of Egypt. Now Jesus promises a life without death in the face of a world that was terribly cruel, where life was cheap, where as someone mentioned in our Bible study this morning, if you lost a slave, you could probably replace them within an hour. Thirdly, Jesus promises a divine meal of himself. And that probably caused the greatest consternation among some of those who were his critics because it hearkened too closely to the ritual of the cult of Zoroaster in which initiates stand under a sacrificial bowl and are literally washed in the bowl's blood before being initiated into the cult and being given secret instruction. So it is, on the whole, no wonder that the Jews took exception to his preaching. And those extreme exaggerations were used by the Romans and the Roman Jewish historian Josephus to dismiss the Christians as misdirected in their belief in this Lord, as Josephus called him, Crestus. Now, none of this is new for us today. But it was extraordinary to first century Jews, even the followers of Jesus. And because of the natural mischief of people who, when the conversation comes around to, to religion, would mock Christians for believing in a God who took pride in being killed and whose followers bandied about this unsubstantiated rumor that he had risen again from the dead. You know, things haven't changed much in 2,000 years. For those of you who are sometimes viewers of programs on HBO, you know that there's a fellow by the name of Bill Mayer who's making a very good living off of ridiculing Christianity and most other faith in God. You see, because we are required to believe something, not really required, but our faith teaches us that our God did die on a cross and was buried. Really. That's the meaning in the Apostles' Creed when you look at the Apostles' Creed. Look how much space is given over to, 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 to the crucifixion suffered under Conscious Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. You know, Jesus died dead, dead, dead. Went among the dead. Was buried in the dead. The reason for that is, it is important for us to remember that Jesus did die. Jesus did go to the dead and then arose. It was not some sort of resuscitation that took place on Friday night after he'd been put in the tomb where he just passed out and somebody came later with some ammonia uh, to wake him up. Jesus died on that cross and it is no laughing matter. In, time, in our time, some people have mocked Christians as though we are like 
the Red Queen in the garden in the tale of Alice in Wonderland where Alice is saying, there is no use trying, says Alice. One can't believe impossible things. And the Queen says, I dare say you haven't had much practice. When I was your age, I always did it for half an hour a day. Why, sometimes I've believed as many as six impossible things before breakfast. Unfortunately, our impossible things seem to be limited to those things driven by electronics and computer chips. There's an old story about a missionary trying to convert a Maori chieftain before World War II. After listening patiently to the missionary's monologue about Jesus and the Gospels, the chieftain looks at the missionary and says, and here we were feeling looked down upon by the rest of the world because we ate the heart of our enemy in order to honor their bravery, that their spirit of courage would not be lost to the next world. And now you are telling me that a man is God, that he is killed by evil people, and everyone who eats his body so they can have not just his courage, but eternal life. Now that indeed is a story. The missionary was compelled to remind him that while the Maoris were eating the heart of every enemy that they slayed in conquest, Christ died only once for all and for all time. And unlike their enemies, Christ came back with grace and peace and justice. The German theologian who wrote in his ethics said, all concepts of realities that do not take into account, don't, do not take into account Jesus as Christ are abstractions. If that's a little esoteric for you, what that means is any kind of description of reality which leaves out the central act of God in Christ is only a partial description of the real world. God really did send his only son in order to do one thing. Not to scare us to death. Not to flog us back into church. Not to start an institution. Not to create a committee. God did it for one reason. That God's perfect creation and the people that he had put within creation had so far fallen apart that the only chance was to reconcile the brokenness of that world to God's redeeming grace. The only hope for healing in the world was for God to directly intervene in the world in such a way that it could never be undone. Several years ago, a biblical professor, a uh, biblical studies professor at a Hebrew seminary, gave a series of lectures on the Psalms, which I intended. They were most helpful. At the end of the week, she took some questions from the 40 or so local clergy who had gathered each week for, for their for an hour, hour and a half of study with this brilliant scholar. And one of the ministers in the group asked her um, in a fairly cleaned up version of, so what is it you got against Christianity? And her answer was very direct and refreshing. She said, if Jesus were the Messiah, then where's the proof? The coming of the Messiah ushers in the rule of the kingdom of God when wars cease and justice is done for all. 
Where's your proof? Take a look at the world today. Now, most of us were pretty speechless at that kind of retort. But you know, after 20 years of meditating on her rebuttal, I think I'm prepared to say, the proof is in our lives. The proof is in our lives. And if you'll permit me for being prosaic, in our lives, in our hearts, and in an archaic way of saying it, in our souls. For I cannot imagine a world in which Christ is not present. And I cannot imagine, and I hope we cannot imagine, attempting to live our lives without the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of the Paraclete present in our lives to guide us. Because the truth is, we are, we are all like Solomon. We all sit there not knowing our going in or our coming out, not knowing what we are doing, and half the time when something happens to happen well and good and happens the way we imagine it should happen, all we can do is marvel at the beauty of the Spirit of God that made it happen. Because we know that even in our most gracious, prophetic imagination, we wouldn't have thought of it. And even if we had, we wouldn't have dared to do it. We live in God's world. We live in a world redeemed by Christ so that we might live our lives in wholeness, blessed by a God who loves us very, very much. And that's the good news that I came to bring you this morning. Amen. Let me give you this charge. <clears throat> Don't be embarrassed to be Christian. Don't be embarrassed to be Presbyterian. Don't be embarrassed to take the love and grace that God has filled your life with and spread it around. Be rooted in who you are. Be rooted in your faith. And just don't pay any attention to those who might come up to you and say, I know about you all. You believe in this Jewish carpenter, and he died. Just smile and say, God bless you. And now go out into the world in peace and know that God is there ahead of you, will stand with you, and will tidy up after you. Because God loves you and calls you and sustains you each and every day. Amen.